this country was blessed not only with coal, but also with oil. This was the beginning of the oil industry right here in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, for many decades, half of the world's oil in any typical year was coming from oil wells in Texas and Southern California and Oklahoma. We were exporting oil to the rest of the world. In fact, we were the world's foremost oil exporting country. And the US became rich as an oil exporter. But discoveries of oil in the US peaked in the 1930s. Not too many people paid much attention to that. A few petroleum geologists and just a few people in government raised eyebrows when they saw this because this was the first sign of, well, <laughs> the beginning of the end, a phrase we heard earlier this evening. So in 1945, at the end of World War II, or just prior to the end of World War II, there was an historic meeting between Fra Franklin Delano Roosevelt and King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia on, uh, on shipboard in the Mediterranean Sea. What they discussed, we'll never know in detail because the minutes of that meeting have never been released. But clearly at that time, <clears throat> this much could be surmised. The US was going to lose its position as the world's ma main oil producer and exporter. That was clear at that point. Already the US was on the verge of becoming an oil importing country and U.S. oil discoveries had already peaked and were in decline. Meanwhile, the world's largest oil fields were being discovered now in the Middle East and particularly in Saudi Arabia. So it was clear that Saudi Arabia was going to play a key role in the world's petroleum future. Now, evidently, the agreement that was made at that meeting was for the U.S. to support the Saudi royal family in perpetuity in exchange for the Saudis' assistance in maintaining essentially U.S. control over the oil supplies of the Middle East. The U.S. was essentially taking on Britain's role. It had been the colonial superpower up to that time uh, overseeing oil in the Middle East and, um, and much of what else went on in the world up to that time. Britain, of course, was bankrupted by the two world wars and the US emerged as, as the unscathed virtually victor. So the US begins importing oil in the 1950s and US oil production peaks in 1970. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So US energy policy from, say, 1885 to 1975 was basically just dig and drill, use as much as we possibly can, because it's making us rich, and we have so much we'll never possibly run out. Well, <clears throat> the first person to, to question this, this kind of energy policy uh, in any uh, serious way was a, a man named M. King Hubbard who was probably the, the, the foremost geophysicist of the 20th century. He, uh, in 1956, presented a paper uh, in which he forecast that U.S. oil production would peak sometime around 1970. At that time, he was employed by Shell Research Labs, and his employers begged him not to present this paper. Uh, but Hubbert was a kind of um, pig-headed maverick, if you will, and he, he went ahead and s stuck by his guns. He also forecast that world oil production would peak sometime around the beginning of the 21st century. Well, U.S. oil production did reach its maximum in 1970. It's been generally declining since then. The, the, the uh, red bars are discovery. As you can see, discovery of oil in the U.S. has declined dramatically since the 30s. We are a post-peak oil country. And that was sort of, that news was sort of rubbed in our faces uh, starting in 1973 and then again in 1979 with the oil embargo and then the fall of the, uh, of the Shah of Iran, the beginning of the Iran-Iraq war, we saw two enormous oil price spikes that led to an economic recession. We had to uh, rescind the gold standard. Uh, 
And from that time onward, the U.S. came to rely on the fact that globally, oil was being sold and bought in U.S. dollars as a way of propping up our currency and therefore our economy. Those days, I'm sure many of you can remember back in the 1970s when there were long gas lines and sometimes the gasoline just wasn't there at all. It changed a lot about how we thought about energy and how we used energy in this country. We developed the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. The, the Department of Energy itself dates from those days. Uh, tax support for the wind and solar uh, industries energy efficiency in buildings and automobiles, environmental policy was linked with energy policy. All of these things started to happen in the 1970s. Jimmy Carter, who was uh, president starting in uh, 76, 77, began making uh, speeches to the American public that were extraordinary in character. Um, just this one, if you want to read a riveting speech with, unbelievable relevance to what's going on today. Just read, Google this date, April 18th, 1977, Jimmy Carter, and you can get the whole speech online. Um, he said memorably, with the exception of preventing war, this is the greatest challenge our country will face during our lifetimes. It's a problem we will not solve in the next few years, and it's likely to get progressively worse through the rest of this century. We must not be selfish or timid if we hope to have a decent world for our children and grandchildren. And the project he was proposing was to take America off of fossil fuels. We simply must balance our demand for energy with our rapidly shrinking resources. By acting now, we can control our future instead of letting the future control us. The most important thing about these proposals is that the alternative may be a national catastrophe. Further delay can affect our strength and our power as a nation. This is the moral equivalent of war, except that we will be uniting our efforts to build and not destroy. Okay, this was 1977. By 1979, it was clear that Congress was not going along with these proposals at least not sufficiently. And so in 1979, we had the Carter Doctrine, which said that henceforth we will use American military might to maintain our access to the oil supplies of the Middle East. And then came the election. It was morning in America. And, uh, and the American public didn't want to think that in fact we would have to wear cardigan sweaters and, uh, and turn down the thermostats uh, we were convinced instead that with our uh, greatness as a nation, our, our intelligence and, and innovation, we could surmount these obstacles and, and we would always have a prosperous future. So the, the solar panels that had been installed on the roof of the White House were symbolically junked. Uh, support for renewable energy was basically revoked. And during the 1980s, we called on our friends, the Saudis, to do us a big favor, which was to lower the price of oil. Because the big geopolitical priority of the Reagan-Bush administration was to defeat the Soviet Union, to defeat communism once and for all. How could we do that? By bankrupting the Soviet Union. Well, how did the Soviet Union get its money? By exporting oil. Just as today, Russia is the world's second largest uh, oil producer and exporter. Well, it, it, that was true in those days too. And so this was a several-pronged strategy. By, by intensifying the Cold War, the arms race, so that the Soviets would have to spend more and more of their GDP making more useless weapons. Then by fomenting a proxy war in Afghanistan that would bog the Soviets down just as we had been bogged down in Vietnam. And then by lowering the price of oil by getting our friends the Saudis to pump at maximum levels, we succeeded by the end of the 1980s in actually bankrupting the Soviet Union. But in the process, the price of oil went so far down that Americans got fat and happy again. 